very happy to be here to take part in this experience and welcome our brother Dimitri. Um, ever been to that place? It is, it is a cultural organization. We've been functioning in the Washington Metropolitan area for the last six years. And I'd like to introduce to you some of the members that you were listening to. Lady that do most of the singing and plays the Congo drum sometimes, Rubina Smith. <laughs> On bongos, a guy that doesn't need any introduction, especially when you're talking to a guy who is a West Indian artist. We like to call him the mentor of our group, the guy that makes sure that you rehearse so that you can get it right. The Tom Charles. <laughs> Stick. A friend of mine, I don't call him a stick man. He's <laughs> an or original member of Evergreen's production. He acts in several plays and he's also involved in poetry reading. Mr. Walter Barlow. Uh, on Shikari, you know, this guy is very <laughs> This guy is very versatile. Yeah, he's a teacher, he's an actor. Writer. He also does poetry. You should make his minor. Good <laughs> <laughs> friend of mine, Sepati Batsi. <laughs> My name is Oscar Henry, and I play the bell. <laughs> I like to call myself a storyteller. Well, that's now. When I was much younger, I used to tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> That gets you in trouble, but when you become an adult, you can be a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to introduce to you somebody else that normally, you know, go along with the group, read poetry, close friend of Evergreen's production, is Jenny Gay. Yeah. What we'll do now is do a series of Guyanese folk songs, and if you remember of any of them or you like something in particular, you can feel free to join. Thank you. Good night, Ed. Good night, Ed.
Muslim, the president, the prime minister. The cabinet, civil servants, they are all Muslim. <laughs> the politicians, opposition leaders. Vice chancellor, university professors. University professors, they are Muslim. Muslim, they are all Muslim. Would be politicians, judges.
Sisters, uh, once more we have a youth group, Joanna, with us. We had a lot of visits to the United States and to Washington. I must thank you, first of all, for coming here. And um, I have a few announcements to make before I ask for the youth group to say a few words to you. Tomorrow afternoon at 6.30, there will be a public meeting at Douglas Hall. Great and a fantastic job that he's doing. He's indeed bringing to fore a lot of the problems that are facing Miami. He's a real fighter and a real revolutionary. And the 
career. Of course, he that is working on behalf of the, you know, the working people in Guyana is many less. And many of us do not realize that importance of these things because when we hear anything out of Guyana, we always hear that the government is the one that is doing these things. But very often we do not hear that uh, the person who is really bringing these issues to fore and is really forcing the government to take a stand or to make changes <coughs> on these issues. And uh, I know for sure that the youth group has over and over again bring these issues to fore in Guyana and has really made a real difference. Um, tonight we have him here and I'm going to ask him to really speak to us and tell us the things that we do not know of what is going on in Guyana, the things that he has been told which are not really the truth. So you can <coughs>
marches and so on that went on, many of them illegal, the box I felt on the East Coast, on the West Coast. I met in Queens yesterday at a meeting, <coughs> actually an indo Guyanese of um, a young brother from the West Coast who was in those marches. And he identified himself, there were two of them actually. So the return of wheat flour is not a victory for the PNC. Unless you want to say that the masses of people in any country have no role at all. No power, no role, no sense, <coughs> cannot be effective. Well, you can't take that position. You cannot take that position. The return of wheat flour was a minor victory won by the masses of Guyanese who did everything except bow to that ban on their precious food items. One change that has taken place that uh, has made a difference, and I can claim that it was in our election manifesto, December 1985, but that is neither here nor there, is in transport. Public transport is now easier. The <coughs> hours of waiting have been cut down considerably because people are being allowed to bring back transport equipment duty free. It is not well organized, but it is better than before. And then the government brought in 100 buses from Yugoslavia, only 32 of which are on the road, because we don't have 100 drivers. That is the fact. And only 32 of them on the road. This will make a difference. We don't enjoy bad transport because it, it pins down political activism very much. You can't go to the coastline as you wish. So we are very glad of an improvement in transportation. It will release us somewhat. We only have to see that we get our own transportation now to move as we really feel free to move. That is one change I can think about. If people talk about medical services. It will be <coughs> deception to me to stand here and tell you that medical services have improved. They have not. There's a lot of talk. This gentleman has been able to do is to find a new kind of a new kind of rhetoric, new, new words. You see the contrast. Just before the election, you were saying you, those two bishops should be on their knees praying to their God for forgiveness. After the election, when he really found out what he had done, he's forming an interreligious organization which operates on the presidential secretary. After ex this is after expelling a priest, one of the most innocent priests in Guyana. It's a man who goes around watering plants. Never said one political word. When he was expelled and went to the Caribbean and they questioned him politically, he talked to stupid. You didn't know what to say. And that was the man who was expelled because he happened not to be a native. And after that, the president was a great promoter of religion, great active promoter of religion giving the keynote address at this convening meeting of the religious faiths. You know? So these are the things you have to watch. And we are people with a long political history. We are not throughout the Caribbean, and no less in Diana than anywhere else. We are people that since the 1850s or so have been voting and uh, representing and, and taking part in that kind of development and pushing the British to a kind of path they did not follow in our country. We have a kind of genius. We have a lot of false yes. We also have a kind of genius. No. So that is, that is so far as those two things are concerned. Let us look at the government's economic development policy. What is exciting a lot of people is Hoyt's open declarations about the private sector. All of these things were done in Burnham's policy. Burnham brought up an investment code to attract the private sector. Brought up what they called um, a basket of currencies. 
to solve the foreign exchange problem. They cut off from the US dollar and tied on to a basket of currency. The basket bought and gone. <laughs> <laughs> they almost have no currency in the basket. <laughs> they tried on retaining some of the foreign exchange for the private investors, and they talked about the private sector. But the difference is that we're not ashamed to do it. Because his position had always been the opposite. So when, it, when the thing faced him and he felt his moves were to me, he was shy. And he was, you know, he put Paris and Greenwich to carry the fight. Hoyt was also Minister of Economic Development or Finance for many years. And he has quite a lot to do with the destruction of the economy just as Paris has to do with the destruction of diamond. We are still in the saddle, one on above the other. Let me give you a glimpse about their economic development policy. They recently increased the price of gold. They wasted many, many years of forcing Guyanese gold miners to sell the gold across the border. Brazilian because when they were paying 2,000 now, Brazil was paying four gold price. And so the bulk of the gold went across the border. They were also getting supplies of food from Brazil and I think in some places from Venezuela. And the miners will tell you clearly, you, you have to sell the gold where you're getting the food from. No, they doubled the price, and it is now sold at 14 to 1 at the US price in terms of Guyana dollars. And they claim last year they had a record turning of gold to the Guyana gold board, the <coughs> diamond board. See, Burnham was a diamond merchant. The <laughs> <laughs> court board itself has some problems. I, I was in court, I often attend court, and sometimes by force, sometimes voluntarily. <laughs> in court, I heard two ambassadors give evidence testifying to the fact what a brother had told me. Coming in the WP office and told me what happens on certain days of the week, Sunday mornings. Somebody comes from the gold board, carry bag at the presidential secretariat, and then some ambassadors were not coming from the bag. And there were two ambassadors that testified that you see they were charging a chap with stealing gold, not putting all the gold in, the, in some bag. And um, Mr. Loku and Mr. Barker, they both testified that they have taken gold out of the country. Well, that is, that is the bank of the land of work. <laughs> No conflict can be set by a boy. Um, well, in one case, this 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 um, excellency had the bag in his house the whole weekend <coughs> because he couldn't find the ambassador. And you know, you, you can tell in England. Worse than that, the the, the, the recent dictator I heard from him about the channel in Georgetown. So one sent a bag. Gold to London with a public servant. <laughs> this public servant felt so proud that Burnham sent you a gold. For good measure, Burnham sent a policeman with him. <laughs> 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 I mean, this is all our resources are handled. I, I am making it trivial, but it is serious. <laughs> They have had thefts of the Ghana Gold Board. Some of them have some of them convicted, convicted. They boast that they have a good industrial climate, no strikes. And this is, of course, because the unions have betrayed the workers. If you listen to St. Lucia, St. Vincent, you hear some, uh, some trade union rebellion, some trade union talking about wages adjustment, <coughs> wages for trades, because this is unfair because we're living here. Do you hear that from the <coughs> What you, what you hear from Guyana is that we have a special court, a special magistrate day in, day out, trying cases of theft in the public sector. That is how many people are hitting back. They can't get a strike. Trade unions are doing nothing, so they find their own way. So this is why I said I have nothing to add. <coughs> After listening to the art and the presentation, economy, what, what measures have they taken? in the interest of the economy. I want to give you real information in some detail, and I hope you'll bear with me. Um, you may say, okay, Luis, this is rather long. I hope you're watching. Um, 
<laughs> One thing that we supported was the petroleum bill. Opposition supported the petroleum bill. We, we have a single seat in the house, but we are not ignored. Um, we supported the petroleum bill. We said it would be very good for, for all Guyanese in Guyana to find its own oil. And my was obviously that it was a foreign exchange exiting point. But I moved certain amendments. Because the opposition must put an alternative policy, must show the weaknesses of the, of the government policy. I moved an amendment that, if, uh, first of all, that uh, they said any individual or company could prospect for petroleum and could explore for petroleum. I moved an amendment that anybody who finds petroleum must be required to form a company, form some organization under which to mine this petroleum. We can't have an individual man like an adventurer mining oil in our country. They defeated that amendment. I moved another <coughs> amendment that any company that is mining oil should not discriminate between Guyanese resident and, and foreign shareholders. <coughs> it must register a subsidiary in the country and it must have Guyanese shareholders. I said that this is the way we have to think about capital accumulation. A country got to find its own capital eventually. We cannot live as beggars all our lives. And if you have the capacity to plan and to make laws, and you will make the laws so that people who have money, instead of blowing it out and buying, what are you carrying? Porsches and <laughs> Mercedes Benz and all this kind of thing, can, <laughs> can um, invest in an oil <laughs> subsidiary so that if there is profit, when they start working, the money is in Guyana. And capital accumulation takes place. This is just an example. People vote against it. My third amendment was that they had a whole list of things which could give the government the right to deny a certificate for mining to an applicant company. I know that one of the things should be failure to recognize a trade union recommended by the TUC and the government. Both of them is government. <coughs> the TUC and government. That also was defeated. The minister tried to argue with me that Guyana had laws imposing the um, recognition of trade unions. And when I uh, challenged him to name the law, he consulted his legal advisor who was sitting there and <coughs> said, well, I have to admit that this moment Guyana has no such law. We have no such law. And there's a lot of um, trade unions being pushed on people. You see, this is very key to what is happening to your relatives at home. Because although we are a political party and we publicly and so defend the people, the sufferers. We do not have the right to bargain with the workforce for our, on behalf of the workforce. And the trade unions in Guyana, you won't believe it, where Christian come from. You wouldn't believe it. Trade unions are flat out. Those who have good intention and those who have bad intention are in the same boat. Both are non-recognized. They defeated that amendment. In spite of that, we supported the bill that the rest of the bill that um, we should go for petroleum mining. We pointed out to the minister, I remember arguing that he is making this law in such a way that if you're applying for the right to set up an oil company or to explore, you apply to the minister. The minister grants the permission. The minister decides the conditions under which permission is being granted. So in my most polite way, I say the minister is too central to this whole thing. You should have some other body there as a, you know, a, some public servant, some body to process these applications so that you can be a kind of appeal board. But if you blunder in the, in the start, you will think on. I would like to tell you the reply that honorable gentleman made. He said, and we, we exposed him in our paper. I, I just tell you this to give you the, the you know, feel of the ruling culture of the country. The man switched the whole conversation. He said that we were mistrustful of the minister. And then he said that he doesn't have to ask in regard to his wife or any of his female associates, I wonder who's kissing her now. So we must trust the minister. Well, all we did 
Bible was reported in open word. And he said, these are the people talking about revival of standards. And he's talking about his wife and his all other female associates, you know, quite openly in front of women and everybody. Anyway, they kept it that way. In the same debate, and even before that debate, we warned them about a man named Chappell. I don't have to remember the name. I must have told you about him. Robert Chappell, offshore banker. Offshore banking was another big thing they had planned. They had signed an agreement on July 4th, 1985. A little more than a year, a little less than a year before he came here. And in that agreement, they said that this offshore, this agreement between Nassau Life Insurance Company and the Ghana government, state planning, this was in order to provide for the development of resources, the natural resources of Guyana. So that was the open sesame, you know. But I told them in the last debate, every time, every minute, every now and then the PNC comes to the parliament, we have found it, we have found it. This is the key to open the doors of the public, of the private sector. And the thing always crashes, and you can predict it. We had read a book about Chappell, written by Chappell, and we, we told them in, in um, parliamentary language that the man was a crook. <laughs> that uh, this agreement should be put before parliament. It's a secret agreement. This was now 11 months. Let me see. Um, no, it was five. It was about seven months after the agreement was signed. They had not even told the public that an agreement had been signed. 4th of July 1985. So we agitated about it. I was alone at that time. Later on, the other members of parliament got hold of this book and they joined the free. Those people sat there and said nothing. <coughs> then finally, when they were pressed, they said it's a memorandum of understanding. Then they brought the Offshore Banking Act. This act is to open the doors for the accumulation of foreign capital and foreign currency and all of that. They don't know that, that um, the United States government is pressing a lot of those offshore havens for secrets, to break down their secrecy laws. And it's a secrecy that carries these bandits to go and bank in those places. They don't know what is going on. The last time I was here, brothers here assisted me in getting some very valuable documents which are making a contribution to bear. Very, very concrete contribution too. So I was able to tell them about this offshore bank. And, and label, let him, <coughs> label this man as a crook who had been under investigation in his own country. You know, um, you know, they looked at each other. They perhaps wanted to know how we got the information. To make a long story short, during the month of, I think it was about August, the Catholic Standard reported that Chappell had had several convictions for business fraud in the United States of America. Government silent. A document came into my hand showing that Chappell printed a thing dated May 30th, 1986. Kind of prospectus. Telling the public that he had acquired 3.5 million acres of drilling rights for petroleum in Guyana. And now is a chance to invest thousands and make millions. <laughs> I'm quoting. <laughs> well, they have a procedure called motion for the adjournment. If you have something that is both urgent and of public interest, you can apply to the speaker to have an item called the motion for the adjournment, and then you have a, a chance to talk about it and hear the issue, and, and some government will instantly reply, or from the British Parliament. <coughs> we, 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 don't, we only get it once or twice. Well, of course, you know, I try. I'm not interested in whether you're going. If you win, all well and good. If you don't win, the point is made. So I moved this motion for the adjournment that um, here was a libel on the Ghana public service. Because where we caught them, <coughs> the law we had passed said applications must be made under the regulations. The regulations said applications must be made on the form, so and so, in the appendix. This man is saying on May 30th that he had drilling rights to 3.5 million acres. The regulations were only published on July 12th, after that May 30th, same year. So I said there's a libel on the public service of Guyana. They're acting illegally according to this prospectus. And I want to discuss this to you. Knowing that the speaker would have ruled it out of order, I took, I wrote the minister alerting him that I was going to raise this on the motion for the adjournment. So he has a, an item before that, statements by ministers, and he just got up and said, I understand Mr. Koyane is to raise something here. If what he is saying is true, if there is such a document, I haven't seen it, it is false. 
So we had them attacking the very chapel. And the, the loggerheads began. Now, that was a tremendous victory. Because although my motion for the adjournment was ruled out of order, I got the answer I wanted. Here's the government that signed the agreement with this man, telling the public that the man lied. <laughs> See, that, that's where we got them. They were defending Chappell all the time, but now they come and say, Chappell is lying. He hasn't got one acre. Far as not an acre has been given up for uh, petroleum. Because they had come back and said they, they were, the four multinationals were interested and, they, and sold um, the mining data at 40,000 US to four of them, and only one had put in an op the um, work plan and so on. Well, Chappell was off the scene for several months. Until, I think it was around November or December or some time in the recent past, the Atlantic Standard again informed us that um, Chappell was back in Guyana. Came in in his private plane from Nassau. He came there to, one of the reasons for coming there was to file a libel suit against the AP, our paper, and the Catholic Standard. But his lawyer advised him not to. The lawyer say, his lawyer told me. And he told him, if you come to work, work. Don't, don't get into that. But he filed a libel suit in the United States of America against DP and against Catholic standards. So I have a libel suit here. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what is the procedure. <laughs> 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 but you see, he called him a crook. We, we labeled him a crook. Because if they are covering up, you've got to be strong in order to get the word across. You can't even say, maybe a crook. You know? Once you know he's a crook, you say he's a crook. If you're not sure, well, you say, watch him. <laughs> no. Chappell left Guyana. Maybe, you know, they, they think the thing had died down. You know, they have this way of things dying down and people forgetting this. But the whole of Guyana is alert with this Chappell thing. They say, well, them people, they, say, they bring Jim Jones, they bring Rabbi Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not Chappell again. Like, what kind of people they say? This is a response. <laughs> but eventually, <laughs> the news came that Mr. Chappell had been arrested in Miami. <coughs> How come? His lawyer in Guyana, who is now talking to me, you know, was very uptight because he tried to get me to meet Chappell. And I said, no, he, he has a strong lobby with the government. He, he doesn't need any representation. I will not meet him. I, I will not meet him. He, he's not, you know, he's not, uh, he's not a sufferer. So now he's talking to me and he says, Chappell went back to the Bahamas, Nassau, or wherever, with his private plane, found no immigration officer, walked in the place, and they arrested him and put him on a plane for Miami. And he was met at Miami. And he's now in, in we're, we're serving his time, where he ought to be. So that there again is a dis total disgraceful failure for them. Now how these people can, can have the face to talk about being the best group in Guyana capable of running the country, I don't know. I told them once in the debate that if you all are the best group, that is a, that's a libel on the Guyanese people, if you claim to be the best group. Now, so that has been the direction of their economic development. We have taken a position for many years that foreign capital and resources can be employed usefully in Guyana. First of all, they have, as I told you in the Petroleum Act, they have displaced getting Guyanese really involved in something on the ground by sheer ruling. We, we seem to be in that state of development in the country. And um, in the gold industry, of course, that, that is something else. They, they have, a, you know, there was a group of people who formerly <coughs> were gold people traditionally. Traditionally, sons of the slaves on the coast it was their development. Now, the, the, it's the big ones who are involved. The dredge owners, they are the ones who are making money in gold. And this record of 14,000 ounces they talked about to the end of 1986 is no record. In 1893 or thereabout, they had something like 130,000 ounces of gold reported in Guyana. So this record, I don't know, I don't know what it means. They are calling 14,000. Their target was 15,000. They say this 14,000 is a record, but it's no record at all. So the ordinary pope knockers are oppressed. They have no transport of their own. They have no proper food arrangements. They have malaria to contend with in the 
sent you. The dread owners don't have to contend with malaria, they are sending servants into the interior. They have malaria units now, about the interior. This, this malaria was a big issue of discussion from all the opposition parties in the last budget. I have the impression that I am the only person um, giving representation to the people. What I think we were able to do is to give, give some, some sort of fighting spirit to the others because they, many of them had been punched drunk by the time I got to the battle drunk, you know. And we, we, have, we, we don't get battle drunk. Now, the whole thing of malaria came up for discussion. We had to see. I told them if this malaria, people are coming back from the interior with malaria, then it is now a national question. It's not an interior question alone because the, the mosquito can spread it on the coast. They assured me that there is no evidence whatever of anyone on the coast developing malaria. And secondly, no evidence of this mosquito, the, the vector, the carrier of the malaria parasite being found on the coast. The mosquitoes are now keeping strictly to the interior. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go to Wisma without hearing a lot of tales about people. There have been malaria deaths. People have died from malaria. Not a whole set. I mean, uh, judging from what we hear about, we, we only hear about some of the information. Uh, and one man at Wisma gave us a very uh, accurate report on what he thought place which is not in the interior, Tulsi Prasad Sawmill, to the west of um, Wisma, the far west of Wisma, this rock, which he said developed malaria kids, which was fatal. So, you know, they, they find these positions and they play with them for a time until the truth takes over, and then they, they go on, on something else, on another track. <coughs> the MMA is a significant um, piece of land re reclamation work. It is a good project. It will, uh, it will have the best water control ever developed in Diana, perhaps, for many, many years. But there, too, they have made uh, serious blunders. And we were able to draw this to their attention during the last SDS debate. What they have there now is an environmental problem. They have two foreign environmental experts who do not know Karen Pro Bush. You follow? This is the value of a foreign environmental expert, a man named Palaski or something like that. And I understand that in a few months he drew quarter million dollars from the IUDB loan. And that is where the money is going. Uh, now he has another deputy who is an, another <coughs> foreigner. And uh, they are in charge of this environmental control in the MMA. You see, they have to see the effect of this thing on the front lands. They have to see how the reservoir is going to behave. Many of these lakes, after time, get very fouled up and become a thorough nuisance. They cannot control the weeds. And as I told them in Parliament, this is where they have the goes around with an umbrella, a native holding the umbrella, and he catching fish with a cast net. He is now trying to learn fish. <laughs> and I told him if the man knows a hurry from a pato, that is all he knows about rural biology. <laughs> <laughs> he is the expert. So there too, there too, because of the nature of the party, because of the fact that they feel themselves a law unto themselves and that they own Guyana by transport, you know, by title deed, they, they can't hear until it is too late. The rice industry, in the last budget speech, the minister admitted that rice, sugar, and um, bauxite had all underperformed. First of all, they gave them low targets so that they could make it. They didn't make those targets. Guyana's economic problem has not been so much a matter of the world market prices because the commodities we are selling, the main commodities, have been enjoying favorable prices for most of the time. But we could not fulfill the orders. There was a production failure brought about by the political system in our view. The fact that people are not properly represented by a trade union. Is it South Africa that you can't be represented by a trade union? Who's going to work properly there? 
unless you want to work in that kind of place. People are accustomed to an, a vibrant union life. Now, they talk a lot about the private sector. And every time Hoyt talks, you know, it's a private sector. And he has attracted a lot of Indo-Guyanese private sector people around him. The slogan was, give Hoyt a chance. And this slogan, uh, I will tell you, did not remain at that level. Many individuals among the people fe felt that this Hoyt had come to deliver them. They knew that he had rigged the election and all. They said it, they abused and all of that. But they were so beaten that they felt that uh, perhaps the Lord has sent this man to deliver them from the evils of God. When the first oil crisis came down about February, March last year, many people said it's not oil crisis, it's Burnham crisis. You know, they're making excuses. <coughs> we, were, we were not concerned. We know that the things would come home. The, the standard of living of the people remains. People have told me here that because of the devaluation, things are cheaper in Guyana. Well, Guyana must be a very unusual country. 